Okay, welcome to Psych 236, Developmental Psychology. Today we're going over uh, Chapter 14. We're going over adolescence, uh, the biosocial development that happens during adolescence. Uh, it's a very interesting chapter, but there's a lot of information, okay? A lot of biological stuff and some things that are related. So let's get right to it. We're going to talk about all this stuff. Puberty, the sequence of changes, hormones, timing of puberty, growth spurt, other bodily changes, sexual maturity, sexual trends, uh, lots of different things, even some interesting things there that are more uh, psychological. <clears throat> but let's just get into it for the sake of time. So let's talk about puberty, right? This chapter is an adolescence. Um, what is puberty, right? Puberty in the United States. Well, puberty is the time, it says there, between the first onrush of hormones and full adult physical development. So it's the time between basically when you start, you know, you get all these bunch of hormones and that basically turn you into a full grown uh, adult, uh, into a full grown person. So you go from looking like basically a child to looking like a grown up. That's what puberty does. It turns boys into men. It turns girls into women. Okay. Um, the timing of it can vary, but it usually starts between eight and 14 years of age, right? That's quite a range there, right? It can start as early as eight, right? Which is very early or as late as 14. There's a lot of variation and we'll talk about what that variation is due to. But most people are somewhere in the middle there, right? Um, malnutrition uh, will delay the start, right? If you are malnourished, you don't have enough body fat, um, you'll start puberty later. If you are stressed out or even if, uh, if you have a lot of body fat, you're more likely to start it earlier. We'll talk about things that makes it start earlier and later uh, in a bit, okay? Uh, girls start uh, puberty sooner than boys, okay? Um, and then some, uh, you know, uh, some people start it sooner than others. Uh, African Americans usually start seven months earlier than European Americans, uh, Hispanic or Latinos and Asian Americans. So African Americans seem to start puberty uh, first, okay? Let's talk about this and what actually happens. There's a bunch of things that happens. Let's talk about the sequence of changes, okay? Um, development, of course, uh, you know, during puberty uh, is uh, affected by hormones, okay? And these hormones, they take a certain route, a certain path, okay, that's called the HPA axis. H stands for hypothalamus, P stands for pituitary, and A stands for adrenal, adrenal glands, okay? The HPA axis, so it's the route taken by hormones that leads to puberty, leads to that growth spurt, and leads to the development of those sex characteristics. We'll talk about those. There's primary and secondary sex characteristics. The hypothalamus, remember the hypothalamus, it's also that, you know, that uh, part of the brain that also starts the fight or flight response, okay? Um, but the hypothalamus, when it comes to puberty, we're talking about uh, puberty, right? It's the one that sends a signal, right, uh, to the pituitary gland. It sends a signal to the pituitary gland, telling the pituitary gland, it's time for you to do other things, time for certain things to start. So the hypothalamus sends a signal and the pituitary gland will, will then produce hormones. The pituitary gland reduces, produces hormones. Produce hormones that will stimulate the adrenal glands. The, and the, and then the adrenal glands will produce more hormones, okay? This HPA axis, this path from the hypothalamus to the pituitary to the adrenal gland, is the same path, the same route that's also taken by hormones that regulate stress, growth, sleep, appetite, and sexual excitement. We talked about the fight or flight response, right? Stress, reaction, you know, responses to stress also takes the same path, okay? Growth, sleep, appetite, all, all these things actually have to do with puberty, okay? Um, it's the same pathway. Let's keep going and talk more specifically about what happens. So, what happens? Okay, so the hypothalamus sends a signal to the pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland will then activate the gonads. The pituitary gland will then send the signal telling the gonads, the gonads are the sex glands, okay? We're talking about the ovaries in females, the testes in males, okay, those are the gonads, right? The pituitary signals the gonads, and then the gonads will enlarge, will get bigger, and they will then secrete or release hormones, okay? They secrete hormones. These hormones uh, basically uh, are the ones that are res responsible for the production of gametes, okay? Well, they release hormones. Hormones will have an effective change, but they'll release hormones 
and produce what we call the gametes. Gametes are basically uh, the, um, we're talking about the sex cells, okay? So the sperm in males and ova in female. Ova is plural. Singular would be ovum, okay? So the gonads enlarge, okay? So the ovaries in females enlarge, the testes in, in males enlarge. They release hormones and then they start producing gametes, okay? Males start to produce sperm, okay? And women start to produce ova, okay? Um, there's a, another hormone that gets released called GNRH that stands for gonadotropin releasing hormone, which causes the gonads to increase the production of sex hormones. Okay, GNRH basically causes the gonads, this, you know, basically to produce uh, sex hormones, okay, to increase that production. Uh, so for males, what will happen is testosterone will increase up to 18 times, okay, big, huge increase in testosterone in males. Less so in females, a lot less in females, by the way. And estrogen will increase up to eight times in females, less in males. Okay, so you get a, basically a secondary dose uh, of hormones. Hormones did have an effect, these hormones, these sex hormones did, did have an effect earlier on, okay, uh, during prenatal development, which affected the development of the brain. But now we're talking about during puberty. Basically, you get a second rush of these sex hormones. Uh, which basically causes other changes, and we'll talk about those. So hormones do several things. Hormones will affect, can affect emotions, okay, both directly and indirectly. So hormones will directly affect emotions. That is a small effect compared to the indirect effect, but hormones directly affect emotions. Hormones, for instance, for instance, correlate with emotional extremes, feeling great to feeling awful. Because of these hormones, you can be very moody, be very angry, feeling awful, bummed out, right? Or you can feel great and adventurous, right? That's what these hormones do. Horm uh, uh, teenagers are very moody, okay? Testosterone also increases thoughts of sex, okay? Uh, and masturbation, okay? More in boys than in girls. Remember, testosterone increases a lot more uh, in males. So males will have a lot of thoughts about sex. And they're more likely to start one of wanting to watch pornography and master it and things like that. Um, also happens in girls. They also have thoughts about sex, but their testosterone levels don't increase as much as boys. Okay. Estrogen during the menstrual cycle, estrogen is released during the menstrual cycle. It, it will produce mood swings, mood shifts in girls. Uh, girls experience more happiness at mid-cycle when you're in the middle of your cycle. Uh, you'll feel more happy, or, but you'll experience more sadness, more anger one to two days before the cycle starts, before the menstrual cycle starts. These mood shifts, basically, okay? Um, so these hormones do affect your emotions, right? They do cause these extremes in mood, these, these shifts, okay? Which, you know, you can see in teenagers, they're very moody, okay? Moody means that they, they quick, their emotions change very quickly from, the, from, from uh, one extreme to another. And they seem, uh, some people might think they're bipolar, but they're not. Normal teenagers are actually very moody. Those that are bipolar are more extreme, okay, just so you know. Hormones will also affect uh, 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 emotions indirectly, and this has a, more, a larger effect, a more important, more, uh, 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 a more influential effect. See, hormones will primarily affect emotions by causing physical changes at puberty. So hormones will cause, for instance, uh, females to develop breasts, males to develop beards, you know, and other physical changes. We'll talk about those, those, uh, those characteristics, what they're called, okay? Hormones will cause these changes, these physical changes. And then adolescents and other people will react to those physical changes and they'll magnify the direct of these hormones. So because now you're developing, uh, you're in puberty, you're developing breasts, all of a sudden you have adolescents looking at you and talking about you, uh, older people hitting on you, right? and saying certain things about you, and that will affect your emotions. Same thing with males. You start developing beards, you start looking more like a man, and people will then talk to you differently, they'll expect different things from you, and that will basically make it, uh, uh, well, that will affect your emotions. As a woman, people will hit on you, uh, people will, you, you know, they'll do cat calls, they'll whistle at you, they'll say, hey baby, you know, that kind of stuff, and they'll, they might even call you names, you know, uh, they might say that you're easy or that you sleep around just because you have breasts, just because you look like a, like a, like a woman, so to speak, you know? 
And as a male, uh, because you look more like a man, you have a beard and you have broader shoulders, you look more like a man, they will treat you more harshly. They will be, people will be more mean to you and expect more from you. And that will affect your emotions as well. Onlookers will expect more maturity after they see these signs, right? And when they, when they expect more maturity, they'll treat you differently. They'll hit on you, right? They'll be more extreme with you. They'll be more mean to you, right? And that will trigger the mood swings and changes as well. That's another reason why teenagers are very moody. It happens, uh, right? These emotions have create physical changes. And then these physical changes cause people to treat you differently. And it can be very distressing. Okay. Let's talk about the timing of puberty. What affects the timing of puberty? When you start, early or later, in the middle, right? Uh, menarche, uh, that's when uh, females uh, get their first period, right? Their first menstrual cycle. Anywhere from about nine to 15 years of age. Actually, at first, it's, uh, at the beginning, it's, it could be anywhere, anywhere, actually, anywhere from eight to 14. Well, but uh, menarche, nine, nine to 15, so roughly the same time, right? Um, but uh, what affects that is basically, uh, the, the first menarche of the mother. Um, there seems to be similarity uh, with, between uh, daughters and their mothers. If your mother started around 12 years of age, then chances are you're gonna start around the same time. Maybe a little bit earlier, or a little bit sooner, uh, or a little bit later, but it's pretty similar, okay? It, it is genetic to some extent, but it's also affected by other things, okay? Sparamarche is when fails first produce, when males uh, first, I uh, thought I said fails there for a moment. Uh, Spermarchy is when males first produce live sperm, right? Usually during a nocturnal emission. What happens is, you know, uh, you know, you go to bed and you wake up one morning and there's all this stuff on you, right? All this white stuff, slimy stuff, right? Sperm, right? You had a nocturnal emission, probably accompanied by a, what they call a wet dream, a dream where basically something sexual was happening. Our, on average, it's about 13 years of age when, men, when this happens to men, but you know, it's not uncommon for it to happen earlier than that at 12 or even 11. It, it depends, okay? Uh, but that's, that's called spare marking, okay? Body fat seems to influence uh, you know, uh, puberty when it starts, okay? Those with more weight, those with more body fat seem to start puberty earlier. Girls usually won't start uh, menarche until they're about 100 pounds. Okay, low body fat and malnutrition will also actually cause a, a late menarche. Okay, so you, you, it'll take longer for you to get your period if you're malnourished um, or if you have low body fat. And by the way, in the past, hundreds of years ago, women started uh, their periods, they you know, started menarche a lot later. I mean, they started around 17, 18 years of age. Hundreds of years ago, uh, most people were poor and a lot of people were malnourished. And, you know, they had less body fat and, uh, uh, you know, they just, they started later. And by the time they finished high school, you know, they got married, they settled down. Well, they were ready to have children right around their time. Their bodies, their bodies was ready. Okay. Nowadays, women start a lot earlier. There's no way they're ready to start a family, ready to have children that early. So there's a mismatch now between when the body basically uh, makes you capable of having children and when you should have children, okay? You might have started puberty and you can, you know, already ovulate and you can get pregnant, but that doesn't mean that you're actually ready to have children psychologically or even physically. The rest of your body is not fully developed yet. So yes, poverty, malnutrition, body fat, all that affects body fat and all that affects when you're going to start your period and when, when you're likely to you know, to start being able to reproduce, basically. More about the timing of puberty. So there are some people who start too early or start too late, and that can have an effect on people, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. Early maturing girls, girls that start their puberty, that start puberty early. In other words, they start developing those hips and those breasts earlier. They start looking like they're capable of reproduction early, earlier. They start looking more sexually desirable earlier on, okay? Those girls for whom that happens, they, have, they tend to have lower self-esteem, more depression, poor body image. Why is that? Because when you're one of those early maturing girls, well, you already have breasts and hips, and you're already starting to look like you're capable of sexual reproduction, and the other girls around you don't, you look different, and they look at you, and they treat you differently. They'll call you names. They'll say you're easy or that you're already having sex. 
and it will greatly affect your self-esteem. You're also more likely to drink alcohol, to smoke, and have sex earlier because men will hit on you. Older men will hit on you because you look more like a grown-up. You have breasts, you have hips, you look like you're ready to produce, and they're attracted to that. And they'll, they'll, they'll offer you drinks, they'll offer you, you know, weed and cigarettes, right? And they'll try to, you know, pick up on you and develop a relationship with you and they'll try to have sex with you, okay? And that's why these women, who early maturing girls, are more likely to drink alcohol, smoke, and have sex earlier than other girls. Because they start attracting the attention of, uh, of, of men earlier. Uh, or they, they start attracting the, the attention. It could be teenagers, but a lot of it is older men hitting on you, believe it or not. Okay, that's what happens to early maturing girls. Not a very good thing. Uh, late maturing boys also don't have it very good, okay? Late maturing boys tend to be short and skinny. They take longer to basically fully develop. They take longer to basically turn into men. So they're short, they're skinny, they're scrawny, right? They may be shunned by girls, right? Girls don't like them as much because they look scrawny, they look like little kids rather than men, okay? But they may excel at school and go on to college and succeed. A lot of them will focus their attention at school and things like that uh, because you know they're not invited to the party so much and they're not out there uh, having as much fun. So they'll focus more on school. They will develop later. They just seem to be behind. And the ones that are behind are the ones that you know, of course, look more scrawny and skinny, like I said. And uh, and the women, you know, tend to call them dorks and nerds and things like that. They they what is happening is that they're just underdeveloped. They don't look like men yet. They will later on. Okay, so as far as the timing of puberty, if you mature too early, that's bad for girls. If you mature too late, that's bad for boys. Okay, by the way, if you're a boy and you mature early, um, that can also cause problems, which we'll talk about. But if you mature early as a boy, as far as attracting the females, attracting girls, that's actually a good thing, right? Because girls will be more attracted to you because you look more like a man, okay? But on the other hand, it has negative consequences that we'll talk about in a moment. <clears throat> Puberty also varies by ethnicity and culture, like I said, okay? I told you guys already that African-Americans start puberty earlier, uh, about seven months earlier on average. But there's also differences in the timing of puberty and how it affects people of different ethnicity um, and people of different culture. Like early maturing African-American girls are not necessarily depressed, okay? They don't necessarily feel worse about themselves. Okay, and early maturing African American boys are more depressed. If you're an African American and you mature, if you're an African American boy and you mature earlier, you are, um, I mean, you're more likely to have difficulties. Okay, more likely to be depressed. And I'll tell you in general, uh, that is because as an African American, you're developing sooner before others. So you look like a man really early. And guess how people treat you as an African-American when you look like a man? The police are more likely to stop you, wanting, basically wanting to frisk you, more likely to basically uh, to mistreat you. People, people are more harsh and mean to you, right? Especially with African-Americans, right? If they mature early, they mo look more like men. So people now are going to be, are, they're going to treat you worse as an African-American. If you're a kid, they don't treat you as bad. They still can, but it's much worse when you look like a man. When you have a 13-year-old, right, it's already six feet tall, looks like a man, and, uh, you know, they consider you more dangerous, right? Uh, they're more likely to rough you up and shoot you, and that's just the reality. It's, 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 a, it's a rough thing to be uh, an early uh, maturing African-American boy. It's tough to be African-American in general in this country, okay? There's a lot of bias, a lot of racism out there. Okay, um, but especially for, you can imagine these kids, right? Uh, they're, you know, they're not even that old or 15 years old, 13 years old, and people are treating them that way, okay? Um, other ethnicities, Swedish, uh, early maturing girls will, will have problems with boys and early drug use. Boys will hit on them more and will offer them drugs earlier, but girls from, um, Slovak girls, I guess girls from Slovenia, don't necessarily have those problems. So there are ethnic differences, cultural differences, Early maturing Mexican-American boys also have more difficulty. Uh, Mexican-Americans that mature earlier will have more problems with police and with other boys. If, but if, if their neighborhood has very few African-Americans, I mean, very, very few Mexican-Americans. In other words, if they're growing up in a white neighborhood, they're more likely to be roughed up by other people. 
by the police, questioned by the police, just like with African Americans. Hey, what are the hell are you doing here? Uh, that kind of stuff. You don't belong here. They're, I mean, they're treated worse. There's a lot of racism and discrimination. And if you're a kid and you look like a man, you're Mexican American, you're African American, people will treat you worse. They'll, you know, they'll be awful. You look like a man, they're going to treat you like a man. And you're just a kid. You imagine how, how these kids feel, right? That's what happens. If, you know, for Mexican Americans, primarily true, if there's not a lot of Mexican Americans in their neighborhood, that basically means if they're in a white neighborhood, they get treated worse. That's what that means. Not necessarily if they're in a neighborhood with other Latinos. Okay. So some very uh, important things there uh, that are, uh, uh, you know, not unexpected, you know, but it makes sense if you think about it, but it's just a, it's just, uh, it's a very sad thing that it happens. Um, other things about puberty, um, these hormones that we were talking about, so we just talked about the timing of puberty, these hormones will also trigger other things like your growth spurt, right? They'll make you grow taller, okay? That's why, you know, early maturing boys uh, are taller and they look more like men and then people are mean to them, okay? Um, but yeah, they'll make you grow taller. The hormones will make you grow taller, right? It will be sudden and uneven, okay? It's not, it's not very even, okay? Because growth proceeds from the extremities to the core. Uh, first, your fingers and your toes, your, so your fingers will get longer, right? Uh, your fingers and toes will get longer before your hands and feet. Your hands and feet will then get longer before your arms and legs. And then your arms and legs will get longer before your torso. So you can look very awkward at the beginning as a teenager. And you can see that there are several teenagers, when you, if you look at them at a certain period of time, they look very awkward. Kind of look like shaggy, right? If you know who that is, right? Kind of long and gangly, kind of uh, awkward, uneven, okay? Uh, they may be temporarily basically big-footed, long-legged, and look kind of weird, right? Uh, the female height, height spurt, by the way, occurs before menarche. So females, they'll grow taller uh, before they basically start their periods. For boys, the increase in height will happen after spermarche. Grow, boys will get their big growth spurt after they start producing live sperm. So what will happen is basically girls, girls grow taller before boys, and they will temporarily be taller than boys, even if they're the same age on average. But then once boys get their growth spurt, you know, they catch up and surpass women. Um, and they'll be a lot taller than women ever. The average male is like five, feet, five inches taller than the average female, okay? So boys will eventually catch up and surpass females on average. Not all boys, some are short, okay? And some girls are also short and some are tall. But on average, males will be, get their growth spurt later, but they will then catch up with women and surpass them. Wider, taller, than stronger. So adolescents uh, eat more. They have to eat more because they're growing rapidly. A lot of changes are happening. They'll eat more. Uh, they're, they will gain weight before height. 10 to 12 years of age, uh, they'll start packing on the pounds. It'll look like uh, basically like they're just overweight. Okay. And then what will happen is then they'll, they'll grow. All of a sudden, they'll grow really fast and they'll burn a lot of that fat and then they won't look overweight anymore. Uh, females uh, need about 25% body fat, okay, uh, you, know, for, for, you know, for these things to happen, uh, for lactation, right, uh, for them to be able to, capable of producing uh, breast milk, should they become pregnant. Now, if they're not pregnant, they're not going to produce breast milk, okay. Uh, wider hips. Uh, women have naturally more body fat uh, than men. They have hips, they have curves, they have breasts. Uh, that's more fat. It's what gives you that hourglass figure. So as a, uh, females actually need more body fat, they need to have about 25% body fat uh, for them basically to, you know, to have these changes occur. Males tend to have about 30% body fat. They're, they tend to be leaner and have more muscle. And of course, when they grow, that burns fat and, and, uh, and muscle will, will then increase one or two years later, okay? So between 13 and 18 years of age, uh, boys will increase their muscle strength by about 150%. It'll more than double, okay? And their arm strength will more than double as well. Okay, so first they get wider, right? They start eating a lot, and they start packing on the pounds, and they start looking overweight. Then they'll get taller all of a sudden, and then they'll get stronger. That's what happens. Other bodily changes, um, the internal organs also grow. The heart will double in size during puberty, and your heart rate will decrease. As the heart gets larger, it will also beat more slowly, okay? Um, the lungs will triple in their weight, They'll increase in size and capacity, and that makes adolescents uh, uh, 
inhale more deeply and more slowly. It also increases physical endurance, okay? Remember, little kids don't have much endurance, but adolescents and adults have more endurance. They can, last, they can run longer, they can exercise longer, right? Play longer because of the increase in lung capacity. Your eyeballs will also elong elongate temporarily and you can uh, temporarily become nearsighted, okay? Hormones will also affect circadian rhythms, your sleep-wake cycles, right? Uh, what happens with adolescents is that they're very sleepy in the morning and awake at night because of these hormonal changes. At night, they can't go to sleep. So there they are on their phones or on, on the computer, on the TV. And then eventually they fall asleep and then they wake up, they have to go to school and they're very tired and sleepy when they're at school. There's a mismatch between when school starts and when adolescents are actually ready to learn. And it's, it's better if, the, if school starts later rather than earlier, but they're doing the opposite. They're making school start earlier. My wife teaches high school. They start at 7.30 on Zoom, okay? Um, other bodily changes, the hormones will also affect your skin and your hair. Your skin will become oilier, sweatier, and you're more likely to get acne. Most adolescents will get acne. Some of them will have really bad acne. Um, some adolescents, a minority of them, a small percentage of them, I don't know the percentage, but a, you know, a small percentage of them will escape this altogether. A small percentage of them will never get any acne. And all my family, I have one cousin who was like that. All my extended family as well. The whole bunch of us, I don't know how many, maybe 30 of us or something like that, uh, in my extended family, my cousins and everybody, my brothers, and, you know, everybody, right? I, with his one cousin, never got any acne, right? Uh, but all the rest of us, we got acne. Some of us, a lot, okay? Um, your hair also, uh, the hair on your head and your limbs and your arms and your legs will get also coarser. It'll get thicker and darker uh, during uh, puberty, okay? Uh, See, so this, is, this is what can happen. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, you may be fair skin and maybe you have, you know, light skin hair or maybe even blonde hair and you have blonde little hairs on your legs and on your arms. Um, it's very likely that when you, uh, you go through these, uh, period, these changes during puberty, that that hair will turn dark. And now it will no longer be blonde. There's very actually few, there's very few natural blondes. Most of the blondes that you see are fake blondes that dye and lighten their hair. Because, even, because a lot of people, there's a lot more people who are blonde before puberty than afterward. Your hair will get thicker and darker, okay? And it's just what happens during the normal course of, uh, of development. But some people stay blonde and most people do not. I know this is not going to make any sense to you guys or probably is going to uh, come as a big surprise. But believe it or not, your instructor was born blonde. I was. Doesn't look like I was because I have darker skin. But I was born. I was, I was very fair skinned when I was born. And I was, I, had very, I was born bald. And then I grew hair and it, it came out blonde. And as I got older, it got darker and darker. You know, and by the time I hit puberty, my hair was dark brown already. That's what happens during the normal course of development. Uh, melanin is what makes your skin darker and your hair darker and your eyes darker. And when you're born, you have less melanin. And as you get older, your, your body produces more and more melanin and you tend to get darker. Okay. Um, not everybody, of course. Some people don't produce a lot of melanin and will stay lighter skin, lighter eyes and lighter hair. But people can be born with fair skin and very light colored hair and even eyes, and then they'll get darker as they get older. I mean, you, can, you would never think that I was born uh, that way, but I can show you some baby pictures if you don't agree with me, if you don't believe me. Uh, you know, I was born bald and then I was blonde, and then that hair quickly became darker as I, get old, uh, as I got older, okay? Um, a new hair will also grow on, under, under your, on your, in your underarms, right? Your armpits, right? On your face and on your sex organs. Okay, the penis, vagina will get, you know, will get hairier. You'll, you'll, that new hair that wasn't there before will develop. Okay, um, even women will get hair on their face, by the way, just not as much as men. Okay, in many ways, hair is more of a, hair is more than a growth characteristics. It becomes also a display of sexuality. You know, like, especially with men, that facial hair makes you look more mature, more like a man, more developed. So basically you're signaling to women, look at me, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, fully developed, I'm ready for sex, I'm ready for reproduction. And with women as well, although you don't have a lot of hair on your face and stuff like that, but you'll be hairy, right, down there, right, on, in your armpits if you don't shave them. And um, 
you know, guys too, right? They'll be hairy down there. And uh, should you be naked, it basically tells people that you're ready for sex, you're ready to reproduce. And that's what that means. Uh, let's talk about sexual maturity. So uh, sexual maturity means that you're capable of reproduction. And there's different characteristics that signal that you're capable of reproduction, that you are ready. Uh, there are primary sex characteristics and there's also secondary sex characteristics. All right, um, so the primary sex characteristics are the ones that are directly uh, related, directly involved in conception and pregnancy. Primary sex characteristics are the ones that basically are directly involved with reproduction. For girls, for females, that means that the ovaries and the uterus will grow and the vaginal lining will thicken. So things that are directly related to basically making you ready to reproduce. Ovaries, you know, they grow and they start producing ova. So you can, you know, produce an embryo. The uterus will grow so that you're, you know, you can handle an, you know, a, a, an embryo developing fetus. The vaginal lining will thicken during puberty. It's all part of the, you know, development. Those are primary sex characteristics directly related to reproduction, to conception and pregnancy. Boys, their testes will grow and start producing sperm, right? The penis will get longer, making them more capable of sex, right? The scrotum will also get bigger. That's the sac that holds in the testes. As the testes grows, the scrotum will also have to grow and that those things are directly related to reproduction. But there are, there's also a bunch of what we call secondary sex characteristics. These are characteristics that are not directly related to reproduction, to fertility. They don't make you more fertile necessarily, but they tell others that you are basically ready to reproduce. So secondary sex, sex characteristics signify sexual development, tell others that you are ready to reproduce, but they don't really necessarily make you more capable of reproducing. They don't necessarily make you more fertile. Um, there's a bunch of changes I have to do with that. Uh, so for instance, before, during childhood, before puberty, uh, body shape is kind of unisex. Boys and girls don't look that different, okay? Both look kind of uh, long, thin, and, uh, and flat, to tell you the truth. You have that, that unisex kind of figure. Later on, it gets different. Later on, uh, males will get taller, develop wider shoulders, right? Uh, and males will be about five inches taller than females on average. Not all males, some are short, right? But on average, males, about five inch, males are about five inches taller. Males will also be wider at the shoulders. Uh, females will be wider at the hips. Breast development. Uh, girls will also develop breasts, which is a secondary sex characteristic, which basically, uh, you know, is basically, it, it signifies that you're ready for reproduction. It's also involved in, of course, uh, breastfeeding infants, but it doesn't necessarily make you more fertile, okay? Uh, so there's a sequence of changes that, that uh, has to do with breast development. First, there's that bud stage, right, where some fat basically grows, causes your nipples to rise. So you can see this, uh, you know, in little girls, they have a little lump there. That's, what it's, that's how it starts, a little rise in fat. And then the breast will grow and it will continue to grow until puberty is completed. They'll grow you know, slowly at first, and then, uh, you know, for a while. And then later on, the areola will grow. That's the uh, dark part of the nipple. It will grow and get larger and darker as well for most people, okay? Uh, for boys, about, about two thirds and 65% of them will also have some kind of breast enlargement. They'll seem to be developing breasts for a little while. It's fat, right? But it'll disappear later. They don't develop breasts, okay? And the areola will also grow in males. But it looks for a while like they're gonna like they're developing breasts, but they don't. It's just body fat. Because remember, they do get, they do they do start eating a lot and start putting on weight, and they start looking like they're gonna have breasts for a little while, but it's just fat. And then they grow, and then that disappears. Other sexual maturities, um, other secondary sex, uh, other things that have to do with sexual maturity, other things uh, that are considered secondary sex characteristics. Uh, the voice will actually lower as the larynx grows. So, so the larynx, your voice box will basically grow in both sexes. A lot more in boys, that will make your voice, uh, that will cause your voice to be lower. And it grows bigger in, uh, in males. So males on, usually have a, uh, a deeper voice on average. So boys, more, males are more likely to have this, what's called an Adam's apple. It looks like you have an apple right there on your throat. Okay, uh, that's your larynx, your, uh, you know, your voice box, basically. Um, and by the way, just to tell you a little bit more, if yours is a little bit too big and looks 
unsightly or, or um, let's say, uh, just ugly or something like that, or even if you're, maybe you're a female and stuff like that, uh, it's, you, uh, it's usually related to iodine. Salt nowadays, for the most part, has iodine. If you don't get enough iodine in your diet, uh, your goiter, your Adam's apple can grow very large. And there's pictures of people who don't get much iodine where it, they can have a huge lump like the size of a softball on their neck or even bigger, right? If you don't get enough iodine. Uh, you also develop hair on your head, your arms, your legs. It'll get darker and thicker, like I said before. New hair in your underarms, face and groin, I mentioned that already. These are also secondary sex characteristics that tell people that you're ready to reproduce, that you're sexually mature. More facial hair for both sexes, like I said, boys more than girls, but even girls, right? You might start developing you know, a little bit of a mustache and you might have to do something about it. You might have to bleach those little hairs so it doesn't look as dark or, or do something, pluck, pluck them out or shave or something like that. Just, um, I guess, just make sure you do it the right way. I knew a girl in junior high who just shaved it and then it just, it looked worse, okay? When you have those little, the little points and stuff sticking out, especially when it starts to grow back, it looks worse. So uh, there's a way to deal with that. So you don't look like you have a mustache or a beard or something like that. But usually it's like, it looks like a little mustache uh, for women. So you might need to do something about that. Or maybe you won't. You might need to pluck some, uh, you know, some, uh, some of those hairs out, okay? My wife gets a couple of hairs there and, you know, she has to pluck some of them out because it doesn't look attractive, okay? Um, and you're more likely to get, you know, bigger, longer hairs as you get older, by the way. It's just, you're gonna have more hair as you get older, hair growing out of all places, even your ears as you get older, okay? Um, Let's talk about brain development now. I know that was all very interesting, but we also need to talk about the brain, okay? Uh, the brain development. Uh, the brain is actually very important, and it really, uh, brain development tells us a lot about, uh, about behavior during adolescence, okay? So we need to know about the limbic system. The limbic system is that, basically, it's that part of, a, it's a whole, system of, uh, a whole system of brain areas that work together, um, that are involved with fear and emotional responses. The limbic system, which is the emotional part of your brain, okay, matures before the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex, if you remember, is the part of the brain that's involved with planning, with controlling your emotions, emotional regulation, with organization, right, with being able to focus, right? But the emotional part of your brain matures first before, before the prefrontal cortex, okay? So the amygdala, for instance, is part of the limbic system, it will activate quick emotional responses, right? So you can experience sudden joy, right? Anger, fear, despair, uh, you know, when you're a teenager, right? When you're an adolescent, uh, you're very moody, okay? Sex, drugs, loud music greatly appeal to adolescents, right? Because that makes them feel very emotional. It's, these are very emotional things. Um, the emotional part of your brain is functioning very well during this time. The prefrontal cortex is not yet fully developed, okay? So teenagers tend to be very emotional in how they are. Their, uh, their emotions, they, they tend to be very moody, but they're also attracted to things that make them feel really good or things that are awesome or exciting, loud music, drugs, sex, right? All that stuff, partying. It's because they're very emotional. It's because of the limbic system, which is, which is already fully formed, okay? Uh, the strong emotional experience interferes with careful thought and planning. Those strong emotional experiences right, will interfere with your ability to do well in school and get along with others and get along with adults and parents, okay? Because you're going to be more impulsive when you act emotionally. More about this, okay? Let, let's, well, mo this stuff will come up later when we talk about other things. I thought it was coming up now, but it, we'll talk about it later as well, okay? Um, during adolescence, there's also uh, diet deficiencies. A lot of adolescents, a lot of teenagers do not get uh, the right nutrients, okay? In a 2015 study, it found that only 16% of high school seniors ate the recommend that the three recommended, that three or more highly rec recommended uh, vegetable servings. Teenagers don't always eat the kind of foods that they should. They found also deficiencies in iron, not enough iron, calcium, zinc, other minerals, right? Those are a cause for concern since they are needed for proper bone and muscle growth. Why do these nutritional deficiencies exist, right? Uh, because it has to do with the food choices, the kind of things that adolescents tend to eat or enticed to, you know, to eat, okay? So too many hot dogs, too many hamburgers, pizza, soda, instead of veg vegetables, fruit, instead of the legumes, right? 
instead of eating your liver, which gives you plenty of iron, so do, so does, so do beans and legumes and lentils and all that stuff, right? Instead of eating the proper things that are healthy for you, a lot of adolescents eat a lot of junk food. That gives them a lot of fat, a lot of salt, a lot of sugar, but are nutritionally deficient. And, and so a lot of adolescents can actually have uh, problems, deficiencies, because they don't eat enough of the right kinds of food. Okay. Um, there's also problems with some adolescents that, you know, uh, can become anorexic. We've all heard of anorexia nervosa. Anorexia nervosa is basically self-starvation, right? Where women may, uh, mostly women, uh, some men as well, but it's self-starvation, okay? They don't eat enough of any kind of food, right? And they, uh, some of them will actually exercise excessively. Not all of them exercise, a lot of them don't. They just don't eat enough. But some of them will exercise excessively, right? And they're at risk for dying because their internal organs are deprived of nourishment. Uh, you qualify as being anorexic if you're not maintaining at least 85% of your normal body weight. If you're BMI, 85% of your normal body weight, okay? So that means whatever the 50th percentile is, okay, whatever is normal, okay? If you have 85% less than that, I mean, if you're like 15% below that, you're, you know, you're anorexic. Or a simple way to think about it is if your BMI is 18% or lower, okay? Now with BMI here, we're talking about the calculations, okay? Um, 18 or lower. It means, that usually means your body fat is 18% or lower, okay? It's an approximation of body fat. That means you're anorexic. Uh, people who have anorexia have an intense fear of gaining weight. They don't want to eat much or they will refuse to eat because for fear that they're going to gain weight, they're going to get overweight, they're going to get fat, they're going to be obese, but it's, uh, the fear is overblown. I mean, they're, not, they're hardly eating at all and they usually look like skeletons, okay? They have disturbed body perception, right? They see themselves as actually heavier than they actually are. And they're in denial about their problem. And will make excuses that they don't have a problem, that they eat a lot, but they're just naturally skinny, right? It, don't believe them. It's bull. They're not. They are saying that, but just if you're around them a lot, you'll see they almost never eat. And I actually knew someone like that, by the way. Um, I never saw her eat anything. The only thing I saw her do was eat coffee. I mean, drink coffee. Never saw her eat a damn thing. And guess what? Last year, actually not even last year, a few months ago, she died. She starved herself to death. Okay. It does happen. Um, in adolescent females, there's also a lack of menstruation. If you don't have your period anymore, right? If you are that skinny, your body is telling you you're, even, you're too unhealthy to even reproduce. That's a sign that you're in serious danger, right? Uh, anorexia is spreading worldwide, especially in urban areas, right? Has a lot to do with things that are in the media. You see women on TV, on the internet, in commercials, uh, and these women are considered desirable, and they're all in incredibly skinny. And women believe that they have to be skinny. And as more people around the world watch American TV, there's more and more women becoming anorexic, even in places where it was unheard of, like in Latin America or even Africa. You're, you're getting people who are anorexic. Used to be unheard of in those places. It's a very different culture, you know, where women are encouraged to have bigger hips, okay, and be fuller, encouraged to have a fuller physique. Even they're becoming anorexic. It's a small percentage of them, though, but it is spreading worldwide. About 5 to 20% of anorexics actually starve to death. 5% of them, up to 20%, depending which study you read, you read, will actually die from lack of food. And I know someone that that happened to. And it is very sad, by the way. Okay? And uh, they're in denial. They'll make excuses. Oh, my body cannot absorb food that well. I have gastrointestinal problems. Yeah, you have those problems because you don't eat. That's why. Um, but it's a very sad thing. And I've seen it happen to people. And, um, you know, I, it was just a, a, a thing, you know. And it's just something that happens. It's, it's a very sad thing. Um, and it, this is something that starts during adolescence, by the way, but it's not only adolescents who have this, it can continue into adulthood. This particular person I'm talking about uh, was someone who died later, beyond adolescence, okay? But adolescence is when this problem starts. Another uh, uh, eating disorder will also be bulimia nervosa. This could have been in the, in, in the chapter on, psycho, uh, on psychosocial development, but we're talking about it here because it's heavily biological. Bulimia nervosa is compulsive binge eating and purging. This is when basically people 
uh, stuff themselves, they, they overeat, and then they force themselves to puke it out. That's what it is. The binges is basically when they consume lots of food in one sitting, thousands of calories. Some of them might consume 10,000 calories in one meal, in one sitting, okay? And then they feel guilty afterward and they'll purge themselves. They'll cause themselves to vomit or will take things that will cause them to have diarrhea. They'll use laxatives, which also cause diarrhea, right? Um, one survey showed that in high school, 6.6% of girls and about 2.2% of boys use these kind of methods to try to lose weight. Vomiting, you know, inducing diarrhea, using laxatives, right? But binging and purging, right, where they overeat and then they vomit or, you know, cause themselves to have di diarrhea, usually vomiting. Uh, this must occur at least once a week for at least three months for it to be considered bulimia. Just because you did it once doesn't mean you're bulimic or a few times. You have to do it at least once a week for three months, okay, for the clinical diagnosis. About one to 3% of women are bulimic. There are men also, but it's more rare in men, but it does happen. Gastrointestinal problems are also are common in people like this. Cardiac at rest, right? You can more likely have a heart attack and die. Uh, you're messing with the electrolytes in your body. I will also tell you something else you may not know about bulimics is that if you continue doing this after a while, it'll start to rot your teeth, all that acid from all that vomiting. Your hair will begin to fall out from lack of protein. I know someone that this has happened to, and this person is still alive, yeah, but uh, someone who has gone through this, you know, and I didn't understand, you know, didn't know much about this person until she told me once that, you know, she was combing her hair and her hair started falling out, big chunk of hair fell out. And then I understood, oh my God, you're bulimic. And then her other behavior made sense, how we would go out to eat and she would disappear sometimes and excuse herself, she's got to go to the bathroom. What she was going to the bathroom for was to puke out the food that she had just eaten. Okay, things like that. Uh, let's talk about sexual activity. Sexual activity is also something that uh, can occur during adolescence, uh, during puberty. Um, this is something that's also psychological that we could have talked about during the uh, chapter on uh, psychosocial development, but it's coming up now. So we'll talk about it now. It's also related to the biological development during puberty. Okay, a lot of things overlap. But, um, you know, these sexual impulses, um, uh, sexual impulses are, are mostly toward partners of the same age um, during puberty. Okay, so remember, you start this sequence of changes, all these hormones, they increase sexual desire, especially testosterone. Okay, testosterone goes up much more in men. Men have a lot more sexual desire, it seems, uh, than women. Um, women, not as much, um, but it can vary, okay? But so the sexual impulse, sexual desire, usually it's toward people of the same age, okay? Um, yeah, you're attracted to usually people your age, right? Girls are more interested in depth of romance than boys. Boys are more interested in the physical stuff, right? They want to have sex. They're interested. I mean, they're, they're attracted to breasts and and long legs and hips and things like that, things that tell them that you're basically ready to reproduce. But girls are more interested in the whole romance thing, right? They want someone to be close to, someone they can talk to, and sure, they have the sexual desire, but it's not as strong as, a, as in men or as in, as in boys. Usually toward people the same age. I will tell you though, just to caution you guys, there are plenty of men out there who will hit on younger girls that are underage, okay? And those are the ones you gotta watch out for. Because usually when they, they're just attracted to people their age, they usually don't know what they're doing. And a lot of those relationships are not, don't, won't really involve sex. But if you have a girl who's an adolescent who gets involved with an older man, right? That's more likely to involve sex because this older man knows how to get what he wants. And technically that's basically statutory rape, just so you know. It's not allowed for basically someone under the age of 18 to be in a sexual relationship with an older person but it usually involves older men preying on younger women. Um, sometimes women, you know, older women will prey on younger boys. We've seen instances of that, but that's less common, okay? But usually it's toward, they, they, they express this sexual desire to people their own age, okay? As it should be. For most of the 20th century, there's been an increasing number of adolescents becoming sexually active, okay? More and more adolescents are becoming sexually active, okay? That reversed in 1990, about 51% of adolescents had sex in 2005, right? They reported that they have had sex, right? African-Americans, 68% of them reported they had sex in, in 1990. Latinos, 51%, whites, 43%. Uh, keep in mind, this is done with surveys, so it's questionable whether they're being honest about this or not. Um, you know, so 
you know, the, the truth is, you know, probably a little bit different. Um, what, you know, why do we care about sexual activity during adolescence, right? Like we don't care about it once you're an adult, right? You can do whatever you want, as long as you protect yourself well. Um, because uh, sexual behavior during adolescence usually is very risky, okay? Uh, there's a lot of sexual transmitted infections out there. We used to call them sexual transmitted diseases. Now we call them sexually transmitted infections because some of them are infections that they can actually be cured with the proper antibiotics. Sexually active, active teens are actually have very high rates of STIs. Sexually active teens are very likely to have some kind of infection or disease sexually, that's sexually transmitted. Uh, chlamydia is the most uh, common one, and that's an infection. If left untreated, chlamydia can cause infertility. Chlam chlamydia can be treated with antibiotics. They can get rid of it, okay? But it's the most common one, getting that infection. There's also uh, the human pepal, I'm not going to say the HPV virus, okay, um, which increases the chance of having uh, cancer of the uterus, uterine cancer, okay? Uh, there, there's a vaccine <coughs> for it now. Some people are against it and think that somehow it's going to make teens more likely to be sexually active. That's a bunch of bull, okay? Most teens don't even know what the heck HPV is. If you give them a vaccine to protect them from this kind of cancer, it's not going to make them have sex more or make them have sex earlier. They have no idea what the hell that is most of them, okay? HIV is a very serious one, of course, that can lead to AIDS, okay? Uh, which can cause death if untreated. I will tell you now, there's some very good treatments for AIDS, okay? You don't have to die of AIDS anymore, but you better hope to have, to have some damn good insurance, okay? Um, I suppose if you're poor, and you know, you can still get treatment for AIDS. I've known people who have gotten treatment for it, and even though they're poor they, and they don't have much insurance, I've gotten uh, treated for it. But it's something that could be deadly if not uh, if left untreated. But AIDS treatment in general is expensive, okay? If you were to pay for it yourself, it would cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars to get that treated. And it used to cost millions in the past, okay? But there's some very good treatment that you don't have to die of AIDS anymore. It's not a death sentence anymore, okay? Uh, a lot of people still do though, around the world. Um, ages 15 to 24, about one, about one fourth of uh, people 15 to 24 are sexually active. That doesn't mean they've had sex once. That means they're having sex repeatedly, over and over again, regularly, about one fourth of them, okay? Uh, and about half of them have some kind of sexually transmitted infection. Think about that, all right? Have sex with one person, have unprotected sex, you have a 50% chance that you're gonna get something. That's how scary it is. Um, under, if you're under 16, when you start having sex, you're very likely to contract a sexually transmitted infection you're less likely to seek immediate treatment because you're embarrassed about it. You don't want your parents to know that you're having sex, right? You're less likely to tell your partner or more likely to spread it to your partner or, have, or you guys spread it to other people, okay? Maybe you're not even together anymore and you don't want to tell the other person, but they can spread it, right? There was a survey that showed that in the U.S., 46% of senior girls used the condom when they had sex during the last time. So, they, so, if they, they had, so those that have had sex, they were asked, you know, basically, did you use a condom? Less than half of them actually did. Think about that. Most of them are having unprotected sex. And that number is probably too high. There's probably a lot of them saying that they did when they did not. Okay? Teenagers engage in very risky, risky sexual behavior. Very risky behavior in general. Um, hazards related to adolescent sexual activity. Why do we care about this other than just the infections? Okay, well, there's, a, there's other things that are more psychological. Um, that are related to early sexual activity. There's a correlation of, uh, between early, uh, early sex um, and depression, drug abuse and lifelong problems. Uh, those that have sex early are more likely to be depressed, more likely to have problems with drugs, right? Drug abuse, and more likely to have other lifelong problems. If you get pregnant, you have a kid, you're more likely to raise that child by yourself absence of the party for raising the child. Guess who has, who has to raise the child? The mother. You had sex with someone, you got pregnant, right? Usually that person is not even ready to be a father, not responsible enough. They're too young like you. Or maybe it is an older person, right? But guess what? Uh, they're likely not to stick around. It was not, a, it, it's usually not, they're, they're not ready for commitment. Usually people in these relationships 
or when or, or often it's with an older man who doesn't even want to take responsibility or they don't want people to know that they were having sex with you so you're likely to end up as a as a teenage uh, mother end up raising that child by yourself or maybe your parents will often help you as well but either way not likely to be uh, with the uh, partner okay there's increased complexity also and expense related to parenting um, you know especially if you have fewer family helpers it's hard to raise a child it's expensive and doing that as a teenager makes your life more difficult you're more likely to get you know, there's more common and dangerous STIs if you have start having sex earlier you're more likely to get a sex, sexually transmitted infection in a serious one at, at, at that okay teenage pregnancy okay so why teenage pregnancy um, well, here's the thing. Uh, it's not a very, uh, not a very advisable thing. It happens a lot, but it's not something that is uh, very good when it does happen. Okay, it's it's a it's a bad thing for the most part. Uh, girls that get pregnant within one to two years after menarche, the ones that just started puberty, uh, are more likely to have complications during pregnancy. Their bodies aren't even ready, right, to basically, uh, uh, you know, develop a child all the way to concept, all the way to uh, to birth, basically. They're more risk of having a spontaneous abortion, more risk of having high blood pressure, having a stillbirth where the child is born basically lifeless, life, lifeless. more likely having a C-section, low birth weight, right? More likely to have complications. The uterus and the body are not yet mature when it's only been a few years, one or two years since you've uh, uh, had started menarche. I mean, think about it. How old are you, you know? If you started at 12 when you had menarche, 13, 14, and you're giving birth, your body's not ready. The body must adjust to the presence of new hormones, the new hormones of the developing fetus, by the way, and, 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 uh, and your hormones, because you're still an adolescent. So there's a lot of hormones circulating. Teenage mothers tend to be sicker as adults. They don't live as long, but for economic reasons, not biology. Uh, it's because they have, they're more likely to be poor. When you're a teenage mother, you're less likely to finish school, less likely to go on to college, more likely to have a job that doesn't pay well, less likely to have health insurance, and your life is going to be worse. It doesn't mean that you can't succeed, but life is hard enough as it is, okay? Especially if you're poor already, and then try to raise a child when you're not even ready. It's, it's very complicated. Birth complications are uh, not more common. Once you're 16 and 19, once you're about 16 years old, 19 years old, your body can handle the pregnancy fine and you're not going to be at risk for more complications but in general being a teenage mother uh, will usually lower your standard of living it makes your life much more difficult you think it's hard to get through school right try raising a child at the same time think it's hard to go to work and go to college at the same time try to do it while you're raising a child it's very difficult it's hard enough as it is already more about teenage pregnancy teenage pregnancy slows educational achievement you're less likely to finish school, less likely to go on to college. It reduces the chances of employment. You're less likely to get a job, right? Because you're raising this child. How can you get a job if you basically have to take care of this child? Or you have to pay somebody to take care of that child. You can't afford it as a teenage mother. If you're lucky, you have parents or grandparents who will help you out so maybe you can go to school and go to work, okay? You're less likely to get married. That's a sad thing, but Yes, you're a teenage mother, right? You had a child with someone. That person likely isn't going to be the one you're going to end up with. And then later on, you have somebody else's kids. And then it's harder for people to commit to you and want to marry you. You still can. It depends on how attractive you are, how desirable you are. But it's harder for people to commit to you if you have children with somebody else. Okay? Teenage mothers who marry are more likely to be abused and abandoned and divorced. It just makes life harder, okay? Consequences for the child, the, likely, the child is more likely to have prenatal and birth complications. We talked about those. More likely to have brain damage, low birth weight, right? More likely to be mistreated. The child is more likely to be mistreated once the child is born because they're being raised by a teenage mother who's usually poor, angry, frustrated. Life sucks when you're a teenage mother, okay? Low educational success, right? Even for the child, okay? Because they grow up poor and disadvantaged and it's harder for them to basically succeed to do well in school and go to college and all stuff they're more likely to use drugs themselves more likely to drop out of school themselves be delinquent and be a teenage parent themselves it usually uh, often history tends to repeat itself okay 
uh, you don't want to get into that cycle. It's hard enough just to break out of the cycle of poverty. And then what a cycle of teenage pregnancy and poverty is even more difficult to break out of. Okay. Uh, sexual problems in adolescence. Um, there, there are less problems than in earlier decades. All right. Um, there are positive trends. Uh, there's been a decrease in ten, teen births in every nation. Uh, teenage pregnancy is less of a problem than it used to be. It used to be very, very common, by the way, like in the 90s. I remember when I was a kid, it used to be rare. And then if you got pregnant as a teenager, it was like, oh my God, what, like, what happened? You know, that kind of stuff. Like, how could you do this? And then in the 90s, it was like there was a whole bunch of teenagers that got pregnant or something like that. It became very common. And then they started emphasizing birth control and other things. And the teenage pregnancy rate has gone down, which is a very good thing. There's rise in the use of contraception. There's been a rise in that. People are more likely to protect themselves like, especially with birth control. Condom use is not as common as it should be, but they're more likely to be on the pill now, more likely to have birth control. A, teen, a decrease in the teen abortion rate. Uh, those things are related, by the way. You want less abortions, okay? Then you should emphasize birth control. Teenagers, young adults, they're gonna have sex, a lot of them. Not all of them, but a lot of them will. And you're gonna get a bunch of pregnancies if you don't make contraception available, the pill, you know, the, the whatever it is, the, the, the shot, there's many kinds, or the intrauterine devices, a lot of different types of uh, birth control, some more permanent than others, uh, some of them more use, I mean, uh, less invasive than others, but we need to emphasize that, right? So that there's less teen pregnancies and therefore less abortions. A lot of abortions happen because of the unwanted pregnancies. So yes, if you, I understand that abortion uh, is a bad thing. You don't want to have an abortion, okay? You shouldn't have an abortion. You shouldn't have to go through that. But if people use contraception, that is less likely to happen. And I don't understand, I understand how people could be against abortion. I, I don't understand how the same people are, that are against abortion are also against contraception. That is stupid. That doesn't make any sense, okay? It just doesn't, all right? You need to be for contraception. You don't have to be for abortion. Nobody wants more abortions, okay? But you definitely should be okay with contraception, okay? You should not take that away from adolescents or teenagers or whatever you want to call them. And they shouldn't need their parents' permission to use it because if they do, they're not going to use it. They're not going to get it. They're going to be doing stuff that you're not even aware of. You might as well educate your kids and tell them about it so they can use it even if they don't tell you about it, okay? You need to be for contraception. It's actually a good thing, okay? prevent unwanted pregnancies. Um, other problems, sexual abuse, okay? Uh, the use of an unconsenting person for sexual pleasure, okay? Um, yeah, sexual abuse does happen a lot during adolescence. It's, it's a very awful thing that happens, right? Often it's just not something that uh, the teenager wanted or intended. Somebody forced themselves on, on them and that's called sexual abuse. It comes in many forms from fondling uh, to rape, uh, you know, to sodomy, many different things, okay? Um, it damages the person's ability to establish a trusting, comfortable, and intimate relationship. If you've been abused sexually, it makes it really hard for you to trust other people and to, be, and to develop a trusting, loving relationship with others because you're going to be fearful of people and what they can do to you, okay? Every adolescent problem, delinquency, pregnancy, drug use, all of that is more common in victims of sexual abuse. People who have been sexually abused, right, feel worse about themselves. And they're more likely to cope with drugs, more likely to become delinquents, and basically because they're less trusting of others, less trusting of authority, more likely to become pregnant and get into trouble, right? Uh, because of sexual abuse. Sexual abuse, basically, if that happens to you, it, it really affects you a lot psychologically. It makes you feel like you're worthless, you're, that you're not much of a human being, that you're not important. And if you believe that, you know, a lot of things can basically work their way into you, a lot of bad things like drugs you know, teenage pregnancy, delinquency, you know, school failure, all those things, okay? Uh, believe it or not, it's parents, mostly fathers and stepfathers, uh, that are per the perpetrator in more than 50% of the cases. We worry a lot about uh, sexual predators and things like that, but more than half the cases, it's usually the, their own parents, the father or the stepfather that committed the sexual abuse. And it is more likely to happen to, to girls than boys, but, you know, it happens to both. Sexual abuse, more about sexual abuse. Sexual victimization begins in childhood. 
Uh, it can begin in childhood where, you know, parent kind of fondles you or touches you uh, in places without you even realizing it uh, through some just what seems like a, uh, you know, a, a meaningless act, whether picking you up or holding you or something like that, and you might not even notice. Or they might uh, basically, you know, show themselves naked in front of you or make suggestive comments about how you look, you know, that are kind of sexual. Um, overt sexual abuse where it becomes more out in the open where it's real sexual abuse. Uh, I mean, fondling is real sexual abuse, but where it's more likely to be noticed, that's what overt means. It's more on the open, more likely to be noticed, uh, happens at puberty. When you start going through these changes and you look more appealing, more attractive, more capable of reproduction, right? 33% of adolescents girls report being victims of sexual abuse. Think about how high that is, right? 20% report being victims of rape. That is awful. One out of every five being victims of rape. One out of every three victims of some kind of sexual abuse, not all rape, but you know, fondling or something else. You know, um, Adolescent boys can also be victims of sexual abuse, right? And they do experience harm. They feel shame. They feel vulnerable. And it's worse if the abuser is their own father. If the victim is gay and their own father abused them, it's even worse. And often, yes, it is the person's own father or stepfather that abused that adolescent girl, that adolescent boy. We worry a lot about sexual predators, and we should, but we also need to be concerned about the very people who are closest to us, okay? And uh, we trust those people more. They're more likely to actually uh, commit the crime, okay? More likely to actually commit the act. Uh, there's also aunts and uncles and grandparents that can also do that. You also have to watch out for them. Um, you know, it's just a, a bad thing. There's a lot of people that we can't trust and we often don't, we often don't know it until it's too late. Uh, sex trafficking is something that needs more attention that uh, happens. Uh, we don't know to what extent it happens, but adolescent girls are most common victims of sex trafficking. It's more common in other countries where they're, they're you know, they're basically, uh, you know, basically abducted and then, you know, end up working in some brothel or some, you know, end up working for some prostitution ring or something like that. Uh, even in Mexico, happens even here in the U.S. In the United States, there might be a thousand to three hundred thirty-six thousand victims. We don't really know, but we know it happens. Just don't know how common it is. Could this happen to someone in your community? You might think that maybe that only happens in disadvantaged neighborhoods, poor communities. It happens everywhere. You could be in a nice neighborhood, right, thinking you're safe, going for a jog, okay, as a woman, and then some van pulls up next to you and somebody shoves you into the van. And they basically, you know, and, and off you go, right? Who knows where you're going to wind up? You might wind up in Mexico or some other country or some other part of the country uh, uh, into in, in, in forced prostitution or something like that. It's a very awful thing. It happens a lot. And often the people who are victims are adolescents or underage, okay, especially in other parts of the country, in other parts of the world, I should say. Okay, very sad thing. A lot of serious things in this chapter. That is where we'll stop. Oops, uh, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, let, let me um, stop recording.